the funny thing is this top spec MacBook Pro 16 is about seven and a half thousand pounds. This Asus VivaBook Go 15 is 400 pounds. So obviously when it comes to buying a laptop, you can spend an awful lot of money or you can spend not much at all. And you've got a lot of different options. So in this video, I'm gonna walk you through my 12 top tips for helping you figure out what's the right laptop for you, what to look for, and also how to avoid wasting your money. I'll also leave a link to some of my favorite laptops in the description below. Also, let me know what laptop you're using right now and if you're thinking about upgrading. And if you enjoy the video, a cheeky like and subscribe would be fantastic. All right, tip number one, pretty straightforward. What are you gonna be using your laptop for? I mean, if it's just basic home office stuff or something to take to school or college with you just for watching Netflix, browsing the web, doing a bit of work, you know, a good all rounder, as they say, something cheap and cheerful, then yeah, certainly consider something like this. It's the Asus VivaBook Go 15. You know, the keys don't feel particularly nice. It's not the most powerful laptop in the world, but it has an OLED screen uh, and it does everything you'd want a laptop for. And it costs about 400 quid and you really can't beat that value. But then of course, spending more money will get you better performance, nicer screens, smarter designs, the latest connectivity, but even cheap and cheerful laptops like this will do the basics. Although I would say if your budget is under 250 pounds or $300, or you want something specifically perhaps for school, then consider a Chromebook. Although more on that in a second. For you gamers out there though, even budget machines with kind of iffy performance can still play demanding games via GeForce Now or Xbox Cloud Gaming. These are of course subscription services, so you'll have to pay for them and you'll need a pretty fast and reliable internet, but it does mean you can get away with some gaming even on a pretty basic laptop. If you do have a little bit more money to spend, then you can't argue that a MacBook Air is arguably the best all-round laptop you can buy. Uh, this M3 model starts at about 1,100 pounds. You can get the M2 for 999. They've discontinued the old M1. And yes, that is quite a lot of money. And of course, not everyone wants a Mac, but I would argue there isn't really a better combination of design, performance, battery life, webcam, the ports, the software. There isn't a better all-in-one laptop option really than a MacBook Air. There's a reason these are so popular. Popular. And I would probably pay the extra 100 quid for the M3 version as it is a good deal faster and it means it should last you even longer before you feel the need to upgrade. Or if you prefer Windows 11, then there's plenty of premium thinner light options. But like Macs, high-end versions can cost upwards of 1500 quid, 2000 pounds and more. It can all get very expensive. So until recently, you basically had three options. You had your Chromebooks, you had your Intel and AMD powered Windows laptops, and you got your MacBooks. Well, now there's a new player in town and it's kind of shaking up the Windows PC market a little bit. We have Snapdragon powered laptops. The same guys who put the chips in most of the Android phones are now making laptop chips. We've got the X Plus and the X Elite. This is the Asus VivaBook S15. I've also got the Samsung Galaxy Book 4 Edge here. Just a couple of like the dozen or so first wave of Snapdragon powered laptops including the new Surface laptops from Microsoft. And these are finally giving the M1, M2, M3 powered MacBooks and MacBook Airs a proper run for their money in terms of performance, battery life, and also just running more coolly and quietly. They're much nicer experiences. However, these are brand new chips. It is very early days. And as they use a different kind of architecture to the traditional Intel and AMD chips, some apps and programs will have compatibility issues. They either simply won't run or they may not run as well unless they've been optimized to run on this new hardware which will take time. So it could be worth just holding out a little bit on buying a Snapdragon powered laptop until there's more drivers and updates and uh, optimized apps. Just worth a thought. Okay, that was a very long and waffly tip number one. Let's move on to tip number two, different form factors. Most of these are traditional clamshell laptops. You know, they open like this. Some of them even have 180 degree hinges. And if you do need a little bit more flexibility, literally in this case, then maybe consider a two in one flip where you can literally flip the screen and transform it into a touchscreen tablet, handy for your doodling and drawing or making notes with a stylus or just your finger, or even propping it up to watch a movie or review some documents. Or how about a twin touchscreen laptop like this Asus ZenBook Duo OLED, which gives you double the screen size. We've got two 14 inch displays here. Or how about something like a Surface Pro with a detachable keyboard? And I particularly like two in one Chromebooks as they're still incredible value and just gives you some extra flexibility. And then of course, there's the iPad. It's not for everyone, and it's not a full laptop replacement, mainly due to iPad OS being a bit constrained. You're not getting proper desktop apps, really. Although if you're tempted, then have a watch of my latest iPad buying guide video, which I'll leave a link to in the top right corner. 
Tip number three, which operating system, which software do you want? You've established, hopefully, uh, what you're actually gonna be using your laptop for, and then potentially the kind of form factor you want. And to be fair, most people just end up with a regular clamshell, uh, but then, do you want Chrome OS on a Chromebook? Do you want Mac OS on a MacBook? Or do you want Windows 11 on a, well, Windows laptop? Chances are you already know the one you want because you've been using it forever, but it's worth considering if one of the others may be a better fit. Windows 11 laptops have by far the most options with the most choice for different budget options, for different form factors, different sizes. You've got gaming laptops, workstations, plus it's Windows. So chances are you've used it, your parents have used it, your kids and your dog are using it, and it's compatible with literally millions of apps and programs. Although, as I say, if you do go for a Snapdragon powered Windows laptop, then you may run into some app compatibility issues. Right now, as I'm Filming this, Premiere Pro can't be installed. A lot of games simply don't work on ARM yet. So just be wary of that. Then you've got Mac OS on MacBooks, which does a similar job, but kind of goes about it in a different way. And it can feel a little bit jarring if you're coming from Windows, but I would argue generally, it's a simpler, smoother, more premium experience that's mostly bug free and almost everything will run on it. Well, except for games. It's getting a little bit better, but mostly if you are gonna play a lot of games, then Windows laptops are your best bet. Plus, if you have an iPhone, you can take advantage of iMessage and AirDrop and screen mirroring coming with a new software. But given the cheapest MacBook Air starts at about a thousand pounds, that might make your decision for you. And then there's Chrome OS, which is Google's operating system for Chromebooks, which as I say, are some of the best value laptops. For as little as like two, 300 pounds, Chromebooks aren't for everyone because basically everything is running in the cloud. Not a lot's happening locally, uh, but they found a huge audience with schools and colleges. They've been massive for education, mainly because they've been so affordable. The downside of Chromebooks is that they need to be connected to the internet. They're sort of cloud books, if you will, and they won't be for everyone. Myself included, I'll be sticking with either a Windows or a MacBook. Tip number four, let's talk about the hardware. And this can all get a bit complicated. Don't worry if a lot of it goes over your head, uh, but basically there's a few components you have to think about. You've got the processor, the CPU, the graphics, the GPU, the RAM, AKA the memory, and the storage. All I would say is if you want a cheap PC, cheap Windows laptop, get eight gigs of RAM, 256 storage, and an Intel Core Ultra three or five processor, or maybe one from last generation, uh, and you're good to go. For a mid-spec PC, basically double the RAM and storage, 16 gigs, 512, happy days, and then maybe a more recent or the latest Intel Core Ultra seven or equivalent AMD Ryzen processor, or even indeed the Snapdragon X Elite laptops or a MacBook Air M3. At that point, we're looking at between sort of 1,000 and 1,500 pounds. But if you want a performance laptop, then consider a MacBook Pro. And I think the uh, MacBook Pro 14 with the M3 Pro and also 16 gigs of unified memory is the sweet spot for MacBook Pros, if I was gonna buy one again. Uh, and in terms of PCs, then maybe a dedicated graphics card like an RTX 4050, uh, 16 or 32 gigs of RAM, terabyte of storage. But do be careful because particularly with Apple products, when you start specking more RAM and storage, it does start to get very expensive. Also, keep an eye out for AMD's new Ryzen AI processors, codenamed Strixpoint. There are a bunch of new laptops coming out this summer, which should outperform the current Intel chips, at least until their Lunar Lake refresh comes later this year. And it will also give the Snapdragon chips a run for their money in the AI department, boasting 50 tops for the MPU, beating the Snapdragon X Elite's 45. Not that anyone really knows what that means. But between Intel, AMD, and Qualcomm with their Snapdragon chips, this is a really exciting year for laptops. Tip number five, and let's talk about graphics cards, proper graphics cards. We talked about integrated graphics on all these processors. Many higher end laptops will come with a dedicated graphics card option, which will be a big step up in terms of your frame rate in games and just the performance in any graphically demanding task. As an entry level option, you've got NVIDIA's RTX 4050 or maybe AMD's Radeon RX 7600S or M, and that will be perfectly fine for 60 FPS 1080p gaming. Although right now I would say the sweet spot for a gaming GPU, as this laptop keeps turning the screen off, um, would be the RTX 4060 or 4070. The downsides are it'll cost you more and also uh, when you are using the graphics, it's gonna drain your battery life much faster. These kind of laptops will be best used plugged in, although some of the more recent ones do have what they call advanced Optimus, so they can just turn off the graphics card or use a hybrid mode so you're not always using it uh, and so you'll get much better battery life. But a 4060 or a 4070 will be perfect for like 1440p, 60 or 120 FPS gaming with high settings, but for really high end 1440p gaming, or if you're going crazy and have a laptop with a 4K display, then something like an RTX 4080 is your best bet. 
We are expecting NVIDIA's new 5000 series of cards, but they won't come to laptops straight away. It'll be first for desktop PCs. So you'd probably have to wait until mid-2025 before you'll get a next-gen card coming to a laptop. So don't let that stop you if you are considering it. But also bear in mind that almost all gaming laptops will have a higher refresh rate, whether it's 144, 165, 240, or even 360 hertz. But then of course, to take advantage of your super smooth high refresh, you will need a high frame rate. And that's why this balance between hardware specs and performance and the display comes in. Which brings me very neatly to tip number six, get a good screen. This is the thing you're looking at all the time. It makes such a difference. In terms of sizing, while the most common is 13, 14, 15, and 16, bigger sizes of course give you more space, which is great for multitasking, games and movies are more immersive, and perhaps having a couple of apps side by side, and I reckon a 14 or a 15 inch is the best size for most people. This is a 14, these are both 14, the MacBook Air, this is the 13, uh, we've also got a 14 here, this Samsung's actually a 16, let me open that up, so this is one of the bigger screens, and you may also notice if I bring in the VivoBook next to it, while yes, they are also different sizes, this is very awkward to hold, you can also see the Samsung has a taller screen. So this actually has a 16 by 10 aspect ratio. That's uh, 16 by 10. Traditionally older and also generally cheaper laptops like this have a 16 by nine aspect ratio, but I really do like a 16 by 10. It just gives you a little bit more height. Uh, and while you will get more letterboxing if you're watching videos and movies, it's just better for web browsing, having two apps side by side. And it's a lot more common these days. And it's also the aspect ratio that you'll get on a MacBook. What I would say though, is that outside of higher end, maybe uh, productivity, color based workloads that people may have, avoid a 4K screen. The high resolution will kill your frame rate in games, it'll drain your battery faster, and most of the time you have to scale up to like two or 300% uh, resolution anyway because everything's so small. The sweet spot really is somewhere between a 1080p full HD screen and a 4K. So like Quad HD or 3K, these sort of halfway houses. They're like the best balance of sharpness, but without being too much of a drain on your system. In terms of panel types, well, we could spend like 20 minutes talking about this. And in fact, I did in my recent moment of buying guy video, which you can watch uh, up here. But most laptops are still like an IPS LED or LCD screen like we have with the MacBook. Although more commonly, we are now seeing OLED and AMOLED screens, which for my money, that's what I prefer. I love the inky, contrasty look of a good OLED or AMOLED panel. In terms of brightness, you're looking at probably four or 500 nits of brightness. Most recent screens also offer some kind of HDR, although that is very much tied to the brightness of the screen. If it's 400 nits in SDR, but also 400 nits in HDR, you're not really gonna get much impact from those bright highlights and things like that. If you can get an OLED screen, preferably with a high refresh rate, like 120 Hz, then you're good to go. And that is my biggest issue right now with the MacBooks, 60 Hz LED screen. These are definitely lacking, especially at this price, compared to the Windows rivals. As you have to go up to a MacBook Pro to get their 120 Hz Pro motion display. And once you do, it's kind of hard to go back to regular 60 Hz. It feels kind of slow. The battery life is one of the most important things to consider, and it can vary wildly. Anything from, I don't know, five to 25 hours, but it all comes down to how you use it. If you're just watching YouTube all day, that's obviously gonna last a lot longer than if you're gaming or rendering in Blender or something like that. Generally, MacBooks are considered the best for battery life uh, at the moment. The new Snapdragon powered Windows laptops are giving it some proper competition. And actually I just ran an overnight test uh, watching YouTube and this guy lasted just shy of 14 hours, uh, which was actually a couple hours longer than the Vivo book. So I would say MacBooks, probably the best for battery, closely followed by Snapdragon Windows laptops. And then for regular Windows laptops, well, your best bet is just to read some reviews to see how they perform. General rule of thumb though, aside from maybe Apple, is that you can about half what the manufacturer says. If they say you're gonna get 22 hours, then that's probably a, like almost screen off local video playback. Realistically, you'll probably get like 10 or 11 hours of everyday use. So roughly half what the manufacturer says. Ergonomics, and this is a really quick one, but it is actually quite convenient I've got the Galaxy Book here because look at the size of that touchpad. It is ginormous. It has no business being that size. And actually I kind of hate the ergonomics of it because I actually have to rest my palms here to use the keyboard, which means it digs in here. If I'm wearing a watch, it scratches the surface. 
I kind of hate how big this tripod is. It's better on the smaller 14 inch version of this. Ideally, you want to go into a shop and try it for yourself. And what I would suggest is here in the UK, uh, because we have something called the distance selling regulations, if you buy something online, you can try it out for a week or two and then return it. If you buy it in store, once you unbox it, you can't return it. Although on the whole, they're mostly very good. And actually only this really cheap 400 pound one uh, did I not particularly like the keys. And you can see how awkward this hinges as well. These feel really cheap compared to the, some of these higher end laptops. So bear that in mind. And that brings us neatly onto tip number eight. I.O. or the inputs and outputs, connectivity. I think rather than worrying too much about what ports you're getting, because you can always buy adapters, you can plug into a Type-C and add Type-A's and uh, add SD card readers and HDMI ports and things like that. Don't worry too much. Go for the laptop that you think is best for you in all the other ways, all the other regards, and it'll probably have the ports you need. Although certainly I do appreciate with my MacBook Pro that we have a full size SD card reader so I can take my SD card out of this camera, pop it right in and transfer it. No uh, adapters required. Also an HDMI 2.1 port, which is the latest spec for HDMI. It means I can output to a high end monitor like that. And I've got a couple of USB uh, Type-C Thunderbolt ports here as well. And also of course there's separate MagSafe charging. So for me, the MacBook Pro 14 and 16 has like the ultimate combination of ports. But as long as you can get at least one USB-C port, ideally that's Thunderbolt 3 or 4 or USB 4, one of those configurations, that's all you need. You can use that for pretty much everything and expand from there. We're almost there, I promise. Tip number nine, when should you buy a new laptop? Well, there is simply no right answer to this. In January, we have CES where they announce a lot of new laptops and new hardware, but then it comes out in sort of March, April time. And in between that, we'll have discounts on the previous ones. Uh, this year, for example, is gonna be a crazy year with the new AMD chips, the new Intel chips, we got the new Snapdragon, but it also means you could be waiting forever to get the next best thing. So really, unless you need the latest, greatest cutting edge stuff, wait for a good deal around Black Friday, around Cyber Monday, or as new laptops are announced, then the old versions from last year will hopefully be discounted or people you know will be selling them secondhand and also when it comes to macbooks who knows this macbook air has the m3 chip and this will probably be uh, the latest one for the next year or so i suspect we'll see an m4 pro and max chip coming to a macbook pro possibly at october november time um, but in terms of max now is as good a time as they need to buy one but definitely look at refurbished models and also third-party retailers like best buy and amazon and curry's because they will often have good deals but tip number 10, make sure you still have some kind of warranty. Asus have been getting in a bit of hot water recently for not being the best with customer service and warranties, but they have basically been called out for that and they're changing things and making it a lot better. But certainly one advantage of buying a new laptop is that you're gonna get uh, the best manufacturer and retail warranty, so it will last you longer. And also if you can afford to go for a new model and potentially even a higher spec one with you know more RAM, more storage, a higher end CPU, then that will last you longer before you have to upgrade again. Tip number 11, we're flying through these now. Bear in mind, particularly with thin and light laptops and especially with Apple laptops, you can't upgrade them. So whatever the RAM or storage you go with, you're set. More common on Windows laptops, you can upgrade uh, the RAM and the storage. Not always, look at the review of the particular one you're looking at. Uh, but certainly if you can, you know, whack in a two terabyte SSD or double the RAM, and it's not hard to do, then that will certainly give you a lot more life out of your machine. But the point is, particularly with thin and light laptops and very recent ones and from Apple, since you can't upgrade it down the road, it may be worth just biting the bullet and getting a little bit higher spec up front so then you're not constantly running out of storage or having memory issues in two years time. And finally, tip number 12, read and watch as many reviews as you can. Ignore all the marketing fluff from companies and how AI is gonna change the world and things like that. It probably will, but just not quite yet. And really AI is all about efficiency and battery life right now. So maybe once you've narrowed it down to two or three options, just read a bunch of those reviews. You may have realized I didn't talk about AI that much. You're welcome for starters, because right now it doesn't really mean that much. There's this fight for uh, the most powerful NPUs, and we've got Copilot Plus PCs with features like live translation, which is actually admittedly quite cool, uh, co-creator, recall, although they've recalled that. Right now, to be brutally honest, AI doesn't mean that much. It's mostly about taking the strain off the process and graphics, running things through the NPU so it can be more efficient, give you better battery life. In terms of AI-specific features locally on device, it's early days. We're gonna see Apple Intelligence come to Mac OS uh, Sequoia later in the year. Over the next six to 12 months, we will see a big shift, I think, towards utilizing some of this AI performance. But right now, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Hit that like and subscribe button if you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you next time right here on the Tech Chat.